name is Tom Conkle. I am a cybersecurity engineer with Optic Cyber Solutions. I want to take a few minutes today to talk to you about security impact analysis. I'm going to talk about what they are, when we should do them, and how do we do them once we determine that we need to do them. As we get started, I guess one of the first things that we should talk about is the why. Why would we do a security impact analysis? Um, and they support our change management program or the continuous monitoring of our systems. So the only thing that we know uh, in life is change is a constant, right? It may be a cliche, but it is true that change is inevitable. And when we deploy information systems or different technologies, we expect them to change and evolve as well. Uh, so making sure that we have a process in place to help manage that change will help us make sure that we consider security ramifications of the change uh, so that we can adequately protect our system resources and information. So what is a security impact analysis or an SIA? Well, NIST defines it as the analysis conducted by an organizational official to determine the extent to which changes to the information system have affected the security state of the system. So what does this mean? Basically, we just wanna look at a proposed change so that we can see if it's gonna affect the security operations of the system, right? So it's been, especially for systems that are operational, we understand and we've accepted the, any, any residual risk of that system. So as we implement a change, we wanna make sure that we understand what that change is gonna to do and how it will affect the security posture. Um, it's also required as part of the risk management framework, uh, and NIST has defined uh, it's SIAs in a couple of the different publications they've put out. Specifically, uh, it's caught out in uh, 800-137-37 and supports CM4, Change Management 4, uh, from NIST special publication 853, the Security Cat uh, Control Catalog. Right. So when is an SIA needed? Um, so as we mentioned previously, that changes are inevitable. They're going to happen on uh, a system, and we want them cha those changes to happen. We won't want the system to be, remain stagnant. So uh, when we think about a change, we need to make sure that we understand what types of changes are okay, are within the normal operational uh, constraints or requirements of the system, the way that we're maintaining the system versus a actual change that's gonna could affect the security posture of the system. So here in this table, uh, we've pulled together some examples of typical changes in the system and when you may or may not need to perform an SIA uh, against them. So for example, we see here is the first one is if we're installing a patch. Well. Uh, hopefully, as we uh, put our system into operation, we had a patch management program in place so that we would say that as patches are deployed, vulnerabilities are corrected in those patches. We want to make sure that we roll those out, especially for higher critical uh, vulnerabilities. We want to make sure that pit systems are patched routinely. So it's not really a change to the system because as the system was put into operation, we had already determined our approach and process for patching it to maintain it and keep it up with evolving changes in the system. However, if we want to upgrade the operating system. So if we were uh, running on Windows 10 and we want to go to Windows 11, right, we might need to step back and look at that and say, okay, what are the security ramifications? What does that really going to affect the system? Uh, how is it going to affect end users uh, and their workstations as we change operating systems? So we might want to do a, a security impact analysis just to understand what that change is going to do and how it will affect the security posture of the system. Okay, the next one here we can see that uh, is adding a user. Again, in the normal maintenance of the system, we expect users to come in and out of the system. Uh, we expect them to maybe even get promoted within the system to get, uh, move around as they move around in the organization to get their permissions changed. Um, but the roles and the permission sets for those roles are defined in the system's authorization or whenever we put the system into operation, we defined what we expected the users and their permissions to be. So if we're using one of those standard roles uh, and just assigning a new user to it, it's not really a change uh, to the system, it is a change as to the performance of who's being able to use the system, but we're not changing the security features of it. However, if we're going to define a new role, or we're going to go in and change the permissions that are assigned to a various role, so that now all users assigned a specific role are going to have additional uh, capabilities or functions that they didn't have before, then we might want to look at the security impact analysis of that to say, well, what does this mean, right? How are they going to use it? Are we going to have to train them on the new permissions and capabilities that they have? So we can see here how adding a user, if we're using a standard uh, role in the permission set may not be a change, but if we're changing those permissions, changing the privileges that they have on the system, it may be a change. Uh, there's quite a few other examples here um, that you can take a look at to see what 
may be considered a change, um, what's typically considered a change, and what is not considered a change. Uh, the last one in the table here, just to pull out one more as an example, uh, is new external data feeds. This is one that we see organizations uh, typically overlooking, right? Uh, and it may or may not require uh, security impact analysis. So if we are changing the type of data that we get to the system, uh, such that it's, um, it's coming from the same source, it's coming in the same format, but maybe we're moving from a 2022 data feed to a 2023 data feed, right? We may look at that and say, okay, we need the new data. It's now 2023, right? Um, it's still within the operational constraints. We're still getting it from the same source. We're still getting it in the same format, still getting it to the same uh, cadence. So it may not be uh, required to do an SA on it, SIA on it. However, if that change is coming from a new data source or if you know in 2022 it was coming over as a flat text file but now they want to send it over as a word document for example we might want to do the sia to say okay well what what kind of risk does that impose right now that we're no longer just getting straight text data we're going to get a, a structured file what else could be coming with it right do we need to put additional protections in place to filter that file uh, to make sure that we're only getting the text that's expected right and those are another reasons why we would do uh, an SIA is to understand those changes and how they affect the security posture. So now that we've talked about what an SIA, SIA is and when we would do one, how do you conduct one? Um, so NIST has helped us out with special publication 800-128, Appendix I does have a template uh, for completing an SIA. And we've pulled out some of the key steps here um, that we need to perform as we're going through that SIA. Uh, we'd start by understanding the change. What is the proposed change? What are we gonna change uh, within the system? Is it a technical change? Is it an operational change? Is it a management uh, change to the system? What uh, system components are gonna be affected? Uh, by the change so let's just make sure that we understand the changes in of itself once we understand the change then we can understand why are we making that change what is the business driver and that might help us make that risk decision if it's for a critical business or a new line of business um, capability we might uh, want to make sure that you know or be able to understand that as we look at any risks that may be imposed to the change uh, we want to understand how is that change going to affect the security posture of the system from the confidentiality integrity and availability standpoint and then uh, perform risk analysis right to understand uh, what is the risk that might be imposed by that change? Um, and walking through the template that this provides, you're documenting the SIA. You're documenting what you uh, saw as the change, what you analyzed, what you considered, and the risk decision that you came about with it. Um, so then you can determine uh, is the change within risk tolerance levels for the organization. So that if you determine that it's a very low risk for this change, then maybe we can just go back to the system owner and say, hey, this is what how we see the change, uh, is, is this acceptable? However, if it's a very high risk, right, it may impact more users or may affect users outside of that one system, we might need to go to someone like our CIO or this uh, CISO of the organization so that they understand the change and get their approval before we can actually implement that change. Then next, we want to talk about some of the security considerations uh, as to what are we going to consider, right? So we talked about previously the template, uh, the things that we want to fill out and capture about it. But here are some things to keep in mind uh, or just general questions to keep in mind as you're looking at that change so that you can understand, is that change affecting the access controls of the system, right? Are we giving users more permissions than they had before? Do they have access to additional data, a new data repositories that they didn't have before? Or maybe they have new access to different functions or transactions to perform, right? Um, so that we need to understand what are the risks of giving those users and you know what types of users and who are they uh, that we're going to be giving that access to um, based on this proposed change. Uh, we may want to understand uh, what if the change is going to affect the baseline configuration or if it's within uh, the constraints of the baselines. For example, if you have 10 types of software that end users typically install on their system and you have it listed as these are the 10 authorized pieces of or 10 applications that users can have, if the change is requested to install one of those authorized systems that's all part of the baseline already, uh, maybe we don't even need to do an SIA. It's already part of the maintenance of the system. We understand that that software is going to be installed, but if it's a brand new piece of software that we haven't seen before, we might need to do the SIA 
on it so that we understand it. Same thing if we're changing the data protection requirements of how data on the system is protected, stored, how it's going to be transmitted, the types of encryption that's going to be used, right? Then we want to do an SIA to understand what those are. And again, the SIA will help us understand if there are going to be additional training requirements or security testing requirements uh, that need to be performed so that we can fully understand the change and manage it and understand what the risks are for the change. My name is Tom Conkle, and I appreciate taking the moment to understand a little bit more about an SIA, what it is, uh, when we should perform one, and how uh, to perform an SIA. Uh, but want to also provide you some additional resources here. Um, as, as always, the Optic resource page contains a lot of different resources on other uh, change management processes, other capabilities of helping to manage and understand the security risks of systems and programs uh, within your organization. And then we've also listed several references here uh, that we've uh, collected from throughout industry that helped us in creating today's video. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment or reach out the email address that you see here. All right, thanks. Look forward to hearing from you.